Pokemon. It's just a game, right? But it's not. It's so, so not. It's so much more than that. I want to show you a story that will forever be unique to this time in history. A story full of surprises, unpredictability and some downright shocking results which all culminated at Pokemon's highest, most prestigious stage, the World Championships. And this World Championships was set to be the biggest one potentially of all time. After a drought of competitive play for thousands due to the pandemic, the Pokemon community was eager to scratch their itch and prove who was the best of all. Oh my lord, what a year of play it was. And I should know, as I was there filming, recording and documenting it all firsthand. And now I am absolutely ecstatic to be able to share with you the story of the craziest year in Pokemon history. To enjoy the story properly, there are three things we have to run through first. The World Championships itself, the season structure, and the deck slash players involved. Let's look at Worlds first. Since 2004, the pinnacle of the Pokemon TCG season has always been the Pokemon World Championships. The final competition and celebration of that year, where only the top performing players of that season are allowed to compete for the ultimate prizes on offer, being known as a Pokemon World Champion. And while that title is nice, sure, let's not forget now that the World Championships offer over a million dollars in prizes too, with some unique promo cards, play mats and merchandise. Unfortunately, we had one World Championships get postponed due to the pandemic. Sad times, right? Well, sure, kinda, but to be honest, that two year gap in combination with something else did something I'm not sure Pokemon expected. It built the hype for the next one to unfathomable levels. People were itching to see their friends and dust off their competitive itch. So not only that, but this world was going to be unique. It was gonna be a first. You see, previously, even though Worlds was an international celebration of everything Pokemon, it was always held in the USA. In places like Hawaii, Nashville, San Francisco, Boston, all being previous hosts. Not in 2022 though. In a stroke of absolute brilliance, TPCR had decided to host Worlds somewhere else. A destination that would tie in with the last main series game release. Yes, that's right, I'm talking about London, baby. Yes, for the very first time, Worlds was not only going to be held outside America, but also in my hometown too. How cool is that? Although it wasn't just the location that was going to be brand new for this World Championships, there were two new additions that would change the game forever. And one sad reduction as well, that was bittersweet for one player base. You see, from 2004 all the way to 2008, Worlds was only a trading card game competition with a junior, senior and masters division. This was all set to change in 2009 as the wildly popular video games were set to get involved too, adding a whole new dynamic and player base to the celebration. TCG and VGC. And that's how it stayed for six years until a new world game with an equally wild player base was knocking on the door to get in and that game was Pokken. This made Worlds a three game celebration all the way to 2022 as not only the unparalleled popular game Pokemon Go was set to be added but also Pokemon's new IP Pokemon Unite. Two massive additions with equally massive player bases all under one roof for the first time ever. Although with those new additions something needed to be taken away unfortunately and Pokken tournament was on the chopping block making 2022 their swan song event as they wasn't set to make a return after this weekend. So there we have it, the 2022 World Championships set outside of America with two new massive additions after a two year competitive play drought. The player base was ecstatic, ready to get involved. Can you see why the player base was so excited? So now let's look at the rest of the competitive circuit and how it relates to this story. A normal Pokemon season sees players compete in a combination of local events held in gaming shops up and down the country, all the way to larger regional events with cash prizing too, 
all the way to the most prestigious event under the World Championships, we're talking about internationals, with only four being held in a season, one in each region. Europe, Latin America, USA and Oceania. Not only do these give out an obscene amount of championships points, but they also have the largest cash prizing too, all the way up to £10,000. Doing well at events earns a player CP, championship points. The amount of these points earned depends on the size of the event. But why do players need CP? Well, if you hit a certain amount of CP needed, then you can get your invite to play at the Pokemon World Championship. Here in Europe, you need 350 CP. In America, you need 500, and in most other places, you need 250. However, if you fall in the top 22 in Europe, 16 in USA, or the top four in Oceania, you actually get a pay trip to the World Championships too, meaning Pokemon will pay for your flights and hotels. You also get to start at day two of the competition instead of having to slog it through day one incentivizing the top players to keep heading to events to lock up these pay trips. However, once again, this season had some major differences. Due to the pandemic, the 2020 season saw the circuit get postponed halfway through, from March 2020 all the way to March of 2022. But even upon that restart, all local events were to remain cancelled. This meant the remaining regionals and internationals were all going to be cutthroat now. Not only for people looking to finish their invite, but also for people who started playing through the pandemic who wanted to get involved in the action too. They all needed to earn their CP from scratch, only from the remaining regionals and internationals left. And there wasn't that many, 19 in fact. And in a stunning move, Pokemon didn't lower the CP requirements to this World Championships to compensate for the lack of local events and the CP they offered meaning that these regionals and internationals were very important for the player base. Let's see how these remaining events panned out, as this will help set the stage nicely for the World Championships. While the pandemic was in full force and the season was postponed, the community could only play the Pokemon TCG game online. And while it's not perfect, it is good enough for players to build new decks, try out new strategies, and even compete in a certain events too. If you want to build decks online though, however, you will need Pokemon codes, often a lot of them. And that's where this video sponsor comes in, TCGV. TCGV is the new premier place to buy and sell Pokemon TCG codes online. First and foremost, TCGV is very secure, since the payment system is built around Trust App. This means you have full buyer and seller protection, meaning both sides of the transaction are always fully secure and protected. Not only that, but TCGV is so easy to use. Let me show you exactly how easy it is to buy and sell on there. So if I wanna buy a code on there, boom, I've bought it. If I wanna sell a code, all I have to do is scan it in and boom, it's done there ready to sell. TCGV comes with zero selling fees and instant code delivery too. So if you guys wanna check out TCGV, head to tcgv.co.uk or check out the link in the description. Come the season restart in March of 2022, the playable format was Sword and Shield through Brilliant Stars. This left 12 sets players could pick cards from to compete with. Although to be honest, the previous online events results showed us that there was really only two viable archetypes, Mew VMAX and Arceus V Star. Mew VMAX was the obvious front runner of the format. Its very fast cross fusion strike attack was deadly, especially when combined with power tablets. This let you one-shot anything in the format with ease. Combine this with Genesect V's Fusion Strike system, which allowed you to draw up to 15 to 20 cards a turn, and you had a deadly deck with a turbo draw engine. It didn't stop there though, as Meloretta offered something that no other deck in the format had. An effective game plan going first or second. See, if you went first, you was happy day, you could just set up. However, if you went second, you could utilize Elisa Sparkle to get fusion energies into play and then use Meloretta to swing for 240 damage turn one to take two prize cards if your opponent has led a V Pokemon. You could even use Escape Rope to push a benched one into the active. Scary stuff. Oracorio even offered damage reduction too. There was only one super targetable weakness that you could aim to exploit if you didn't want to play Mew yourself. Well, apart from weakness, obviously, and that was Ability Lock. 
because Mudex was so refined to run solely off Genesect's ability to draw cards, they actually played no other draw supporters themselves. Meaning, if you could turn off Genesect's ability, you could grind these decks down to a halt. And that's where Arceus came in. Arceus V Star was the only other attacker that could really stand toe to toe with Mew. Trinity Nova offered a solid 200 swing while accelerating 3 energy, just enough to be relevant. But with a beefy 280 HP while only giving up 2 prizes, it proved troublesome for Mew to deal with. And that's without looking at his V Star ability, Star Burr, which allowed you to grab any 2 cards from your deck. This means you were never truly out the game as long as you had a V Star in play, especially if you was going first because then you could always be the aggressor with boss's orders and even choice belts to grinch out your opponents only attacking Pokemon if they had a poor start. Arceus wasn't really good enough on its own to beat Mew though, but since it was super versatile it could be played in a myriad of different ways. One of these ways was Gyarados V Max, a beefy attacker which had the ability Skyscraper which made it immune to damage from any Pokemon that had special energy attached, making life kind of hard for Mew V Max. Dark Arc was also a hyped variant going into March of 2022. This variant played a suite of Galarian Moltres cards to offer as retaliation attackers to Mew via weakness, with Moltres V and Baby Moltres, both deadly in their own right. Arc Intel was probably the most popular variant at this moment in time though, substituting out all alternative attackers for a thick Inteleon line, which offered crazy consistency via shady dealings, letting you make use of some powerful one-off trainers, such as Cherim's Care to remove damage, Big Charm to boost that damage up, and mainly Path to the Peak to shut down Mew and other Arceus decks as well. However, to no one's surprise, Mew won the first event back in Brisbane, piloted by the very talented Natalie Miller along with 4 Arceus decks, 2 Arc Intel, 1 Dark Arc and the finalist Lewis with Arc Duraludon. Players in the US saw these results as they geared up for their first event back in Salt Lake City and they wasn't about to let Mew VMAX ruin their party as they successfully booted Mew all the way out of their top 8 slot with Drew Kennett taking it all home with an Arc Gengar deck. Gengar actually featured in 3 of the top 8 slots there. The other two were single strike focused builds, where you utilise Houndoom to accelerate energy and you use Path to the Peak to slow down other Arceus and Mews. Gengar itself was a B3 attacker, with both its attacks being very strong. However, the natural inconsistencies of getting multiple stage 1s out made it a dicey deck to pilot. Salt Lake also brought out one new deck too, one that would only get better as the idea was refined over time and that was Arc Beedrill. Beedrill's persisting allowed you to auto KO your opponent's active if it had a special energy attached. This means it was really good into Mew and Arceus. However, it was a stage 2, so how can we fix this? Well, Single Strike Mustard lets you get any Single Strike Pokemon into play straight from your deck. Perfect! All you had to do was empty your hand and you were away, something that Starbirth helped you do. Liverpool was up next and the EU players brought some spice. Former world champion Robin Schultz took it all home with Rapid Strike Urshifu, a deck that looked to capitalise on all the Mew hate by hitting Arceus for weakness and rapid flowing bench Pokemons like Sobble straight out of play. This did take a dicey Mew matchup however, but all the Mew hate was still keeping you at bay since only two made it in top 8 of Liverpool. Omni Joe and Brendan Cameron took the previously looked at meme deck Malamar all the way to meta status with two top 8 placements too. Its rapid strike tentacles attack had technically an unlimited damage cap as long as you had a ton of rapid strike cards in your hand and trust me it played a ton. Worth keeping an eye on Sander Rojak too since he brought a new Zoro box control deck to top 8 and trust me, we will be hearing about him later. April saw the first of the two internationals left for this season, EUIC. I actually took a Mew deck to a top 128 finish, but the higher tables saw some crazy new meta additions. Frank Persick took a whole new road deck all the way to the finals, Whimsicott V Star. Its trick wind attack stopped your opponent from attaching special energy and tools from their hand next turn. When combined with Path to the Peak, this was a deadly locked deck. So how would you deal from energy attached from Trinity Nova or Elisa Spark? Well, Frank played four crushing hammers to keep them at bay. Previous EUIC winner Gustavo Wada took it all home though with Rapid Strike Urshifu, 
really cementing its place in the meta along with the three others in top eight with some of the biggest names in the game playing it too like Tor, Pedro, Justin and Isaiah. It was definitely a force to be reckoned with. One of them you joined them in top 8 and one Sylvie on box 2 rounding that event out. May had the most events in with 8 in total so let's do a speed round and see what new decks these events added to the meta. Ark the Barrel was debuted in Joinville, a style of deck that used Arceus to set up other attackers and the Barrel to draw cards. You could then tech the deck out with any attackers you like to counter the meta. The first iteration played Lucario V-Star for other Arceus decks and Hooper V for Mew. Keep this in mind because this style deck plays a big part later on in this story. Rapid Strike Intellion, a deck that aimed to use Path to the Peak to lock your opponent down and spam Shovel Loop to never get KO'd. Arceus Malamar, a deck that aimed to use Malamar V Max's attack Max Jammer in combination with Marnie and Path to limit your opponent's options and make it really hard for them to play the game. Arceus Gyarados, now this one hurts me to tell because I actually built this deck the day before the Lil Regional Championships and after starting 0-2 I clawed my way back to having two winning in scenarios, one for day two and one for top 64 respectively, however I lost them both. <laughs> This deck aimed to use Jolteon's ability to lock out all water abilities from the game. Extremely effective against Inteleon decks, which ruled the meta at the time. Kai Vong took it to second place at that regional championships though, meaning it was a good deck and I was on the right lines. <laughs> the Bremen Regional Champion deck was also a slight variation of this idea too. Stefan Ivanov won Lil though with his Brindy Boo deck, a new one prize focused deck that operated with Rowlet, Hooper, Moltres and Inteleon to grind games out. And while Ice Rider was always on the edge of the format, it did have a few good finishes in the month of May. It was just a super strong hard hitting deck that unfortunately had some consistency issues. However, it was set to receive a huge buff in the new set along with a killer new Vidif contender. And all eyes turned to Melbourne just to see how this new set Astral Radiance would affect the meta. And trust me, we wasn't disappointed. Palkia V-Star was the poster boy of this new set. Its subspace well attack did 60 plus 20 for each bench Pokemon in play. This attack adds up quick and only for two energy, meaning it was extremely cheap to use especially when you consider you have Melanie or Raihan to make use of to burst energies into play. Speaking of bursting energies into play, his V-Star Ability Star Portal allows you to attach three water energies from your discard to your water Pokemon in any way you like. This means not only do you have Palkia to attack with, but a bevy of different mad ones. Let's start with Inteleon, a seemingly innocent Aqua Bullet which only does 120 damage and 20 to the bench. Simple, right? But to be fair, it provided enough pressure as a one prizer that your opponent had to at least respect it. And since it has 160 HP too, it wasn't easy to move out the way. However, the other main attacker from Astral Radiance for Palkia was Radiant Greninja. And trust me, this card was simply unfair because not only did it provide draw with its ability concealed cards, but for free energies, it let you do 90 to two of your opponent's Pokemon. Does that sound familiar? Well it should do because it's basically the same attack as Vapid Strike Urshifu but for 30 less damage. The main difference being this was on a one prize basic Pokemon. Absolute madness. This was perfect for tagging two VMAXs for Palkia to finish off or even to grief two Sobbles or Drizzles to stop them evolving up. The deck's versatility also deserves to be mentioned here too because not only is it a super aggressive deck with Greninja and Palkia, but it can be a very good defensive deck as well with cards like Roxanne and Path to the Peak providing a perfect backup option and only being a big shady dealings away. Meaning you actually have a good late game option too. And Melbourne proved just how bonkers Palkia was with every top eight slot being occupied with a Palkia deck, split between either shady dealings or celebration Mew variants. I can't remember this has ever happened before in Pokemon history, all top 8 slots being occupied by the same archetype. Christian has Barney took it all home with the Mew build, and the rest of the world looked at what happened in awe and thought, how can we combat this? At the same time as Melbourne, the Japan Championships were also kicking off, an event that had over 1,700 players. Bigger than any Western event. To be fair though, it did kind of mirror Melbourne pretty much with five Palkia in top eight, 
one Arc Intel and one Arc Duraladon join them too. But the star of the show had to be the one cheeky Reggie's deck that actually managed to win the event. Reggie Gigas aimed to capitalize on people that wasn't ready for it. Reggie's operated around Reggie Gigas' ability, Ancient Wisdom, which lets you attach three energy from your discard pile to your Pokemon in any way you like, as long as you had one of each Reggie in play. What this meant was is now you have four different Reggies that all hit for different weaknesses and Regigigas himself making an absolute mockery of VMAX Pokemon. Since you could abuse special energy with this as well, powerful energy could be used here along with Auroras to make it as streamlined as possible. Regilecki was the star of the show though as with a choice belt it was able to trade with Palkis easily and set up some damage too and just be outside range of Greninja. Milwaukee was the next western event after the Palkia takeover in Melbourne and this time people were prepared. Palkia did still have 3 top 8 slots though but it was safe to say the meta has started to adapt. With Arc Duraldon taking it all home and Blissey Miltank coming in at second. Miltank's combination of safeguard, path to the peak and healing along with hammers proving to be a killer combination that kinda went under the radar. It was around this time that Mew VMAX started to adapt too by playing Pokemon Catchers. This would allow Meloetta to gust on turn 1 going second against Palkia to maintain a solid prize advantage. Very high risk, but very high reward. But now though, I want you to look at this 10th place deck and keep it in mind as it will come into play later. Now though, there was only one event left before the World Championships and it was the biggest event of the year, NAIC. With over a thousand players in attendance and being so close to the World Championship, this event was set to have massive effects on the World Championship meta. And two giant decks were about to be dropped. The first of them was courtesy of our friend Sander, who I told you to remember earlier on. He brought Mewtwo V Union all the way to a third place finish. And trust me, this deck was honestly insane. Up until this point, the community was convinced that V-Unions were a joke, just made to sell more boxes as their usefulness was absolutely nothing. And while they were powerful, sure, they were so hard to get into play, something you would be more akin to seeing in Yu-Gi-Oh more so than anything else. You see, in order to get these mammoth attackers into play, you first had to discard all four pieces of them and then you can... Uh, special summon them into play all at once. What was your reward for this valiant effort though? Well in Sander's case you now have access to the attack super regeneration which allows you to heal 200 damage from itself. The perfect number. Since when you think about it Arceus would top out at 200. Palkia if you have no bench Pokemon in play tops out at 160 and Mew can only hit over 200 a couple times in the game and as soon as their tablets are gone, it was stuck at 210. Mew 2 V Union was an absolutely outrageous deck. Not only that, but you had Uvetel to discard energy, Miltank to stall and Gormandise Snorlax to draw cards. Well, healing is good, but how exactly could this deck win? Well, with a combination of Silenes, Team Yell Cheer and Power Pad, along with Super Regeneration, Sander would aim to keep his deck full of a constant loop of supporters while his opponent would eventually run out of resources and lose the game due to deck out. It sounds hard and trust me it is but when it's in Sander's hands it was extremely strong only failing to Azul GG and his Arc Vibauer deck that actually took the event all home. Opting to play high path to the peak count with Vibauer to draw cards. The slot safe from not having to play Inteleons would allow you to play other attackers like Flying Pikachu VMAX. This was perfect for slaying Palkias and becoming immune to basic Pokemon too. Azul also played Crobat VMAX cause with its typing and its max cutter attack it was actually a nightmare for Mew to deal with. And those were the two new additions to the meta just before the world championships but wait 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 before we get there though there is one more teeny tiny thing we need to cover you see there was actually one more set legal for worlds that was released after naic pokemon go this set however wasn't very good only really adding radiant charizard and pokestop to the relevant card pool charizard swings for 250 or 280 with a choice belt for as little as one energy which to be fair was pretty decent and Pokestop was a high risk, high reward stadium for aggressive decks like Mew and Regigigas, since this let you discard the top 3 cards of your deck, but you could keep any items and put them into your hand. Perfect for high item decks, but very bad for the opposite. 
and I actually played one copy of Pokestop in my world's open list, which got me 40 CP, so get in. <laughs> but now that's it, the stage is set. All the decks we have run through, the players were ready and the meta was formed. Let's get to the fun stuff, baby. So in the run up to Worlds, Palkia seemed like it was the deck to beat. Arc Pika was the main obvious way of countering it, and it had to be respected. Mew VMAX was still dotting about, but it started to lose favor with the player base. Mewtwo V Union was catching the heart of plenty, and it actually became one of the decks that people talked about the most. Reggie still had to be taken seriously too though, but it did seem to be a little bit inconsistent. And there was even slight rumblings of Ice Rider making an appearance too. The format was so wide open that no one could really guess what was going to happen. A lot of people's secret deck though was Arceus Inteleon. It was starting to creep into many people's group chat. Although it was starting to change, it was starting to cut all the offensive cards like Choice Belt, Zigzagoon and Dunsparce which removed your weakness in favour of real defensive cards like second copy of Pal Pad and second copy of Chairman's Care. I however wasn't convinced at all and thought this deck would flop. So viewers at home, what would you have played? I was a Mew Ride or Die at this point so it's obvious what I would have done but there were some brilliant minds at work at this game, much smarter than me. Let's see what they did. However, this world was different in the sense there was actually four days of competitive play. Let's take a quick look and see how worlds were structured. Day one, our Master Division trainers face off with best of three Swiss rounds. Players will advance based on the number of match points they earn. Day two is a new tournament. Records do not carry and decks may be changed. Trainers continue with best of three Swiss rounds until top cut is determined. Day three, each age division will play a best of three single elimination bracket to determine our finalists. In addition, preceding extra Swiss rounds may also be played depending on the number of players who made day two. On day four, grand final matches will be played until we've crowned our world champions. Who among the greatest competing will earn this coveted title? Find out, tune in, and follow the action at Pokemon.com slash play. One of the players that made it through day one was Ross Corform, an absolute legend of the game, with four top 16 placements at previous world championships, including two top fours and one finals one, with a lot of people's favourite deck of all time, The Truth. Now Ross had a little bit of a break, but he was back with an absolute vengeance, playing a variation of Stefan's Brindibu deck, which operated kind of the same, but now opted to use that Radiant Charizard as a huge beat stick. With cards like Clara and Raihan and Twin Energy, it was actually possible to attack with it multiple times to great success. And then in day two, we saw another crazy deck from one of the greatest players of the game, Tor. He debuted a Vikavolt deck on stream. Paralyzing Bolt would item lock your opponent and then Ludicolo's enthusiastic dance would boost the damage by 100. Really hoping to capitalize on hitting Palkia's full weakness and then just item locking the rest of the format. This day two grind was brutal since it went straight from 210 players-ish all the way down to a top eight cup. And it was that top 8 cut where the real crazy prizing begins. From increased money rewards all the way to special playmats, trophy cards. So the players were definitely had their eyes set on that top cut. There was actually no Mewtwo V Union in that day 2 grind. Making it one of the biggest world's flop decks in history. However, the other flop deck in my opinion was Arc Intel. With only 2 in day 2. Making it another casualty of war. It was actually Arceus Flying Pikachu that was taking names, as it had four in day two with some Japanese spice that we'll look at later. Palkia, of course, was the most played deck in day two at 14 counts. But how did that day two convert into top cut then? Well, four Palkias made it through via James Cox, Kaiwin Kababe, Otovio Guerrera, and Andrew Estrada. Worth noting that Andrew Estrada was a former world champion all the way back in 2014, and Kaiwin was a former senior world champion too back in 2013. So both players were not new to this big stage and were both eager to add another world championship title to their collection. One Mew VMAX snuck in with Andre Chierson at the helm, although he opted not to play catchers, instead opting for maximum copies of Rotom Phone 
to increase consistency. The tail of the tape though was the three RCS Flying Pikachus in top cut via Andre, Daichi and Ryota and their decks were all perfectly crafted for this event. They all noticed that Ark Intel was getting cheeky cutting their Dunsparce and they opted to capitalise with some lines of Decidueye V Star. This served two functions. Number one, its attack Somersault Feathers did the perfect number to KO over Arceus, even with a big charm. But the basic also offered a strong shred attack via close quarters shooting, which would make mince meat of mill tanks that Mewtwo v Union would often play. The Japanese players also opted to play a Moltres V to help with their Mew VMAX matchup. The Japanese players though also played a 2 2 Jolteon line. Remember that one that stopped Inteleons from working? Well, turns out it's actually really good at slamming Palkia decks too, since it stops Palkia's ability, Inteleon's ability, and Greninja's too. And make no mistake about it, these Japanese players were here meaning business. Ryota has already got a top 16 finish at the Worlds before, and three top 16s at Japanese champion events. Bear in mind that these champion events have upwards of a thousand people consistently, and Daichi has actually won two of those champion league events before, meaning he was an absolute force to contend with and in the nice twist of fate for Daichi the way the bracket fell that means he would encounter two Palkias on his way to the finals. Andre had the same idea with the Decidueye line but he opted not to play the Jolteon package and Moltres instead opting for a 2-2 line of the barrel for consistency. Andre is no slouch either with a limitless page as long as Mew VMAX is turn one including an international top eight so again he is no stranger to this high stake. So that was the top 8, all fantastic players, locking up $5,000 already, but these players are greedy, they want more, they want their shot to be known as a world champion, all gunning for that top spot, so let's see how it went. Starting with Daichi versus Atavio, on paper this should be a fairly straight matchup for Daichi, established Jolty Unlock while attacking with Pikachu VMAX. This means even if Atavio was able to KO the Jolty on, the Pikachu would still be applying a ton of pressure. And game one for Daichi started off well since Atovio unfortunately received a double prize penalty for drawing an extra card drawing setup. This means that Daichi only had to take four prizes to win the game. And he went off to a roaring start, having a turn two jolty on with a memory capsule and a Trinity Nova KO, really putting the pressure on. So oh, he got the so memory. Horrible. Oh, that's uh, literally everything. It's so horrible. <laughs> Daichi is just mean spirited <laughs> at this point. He really has come here to punish the Palkia V-Star players and uh... leading to a quick succession. However, in a cruel twist of fate for Daichi, in game two, he actually prizes both his Jorions, giving Atavio a slight opening. So we know for an absolute... Ooh, here oh, we go. now that's a little bit spicy. Two copies of the Jolteon in the prize cards. And a memory capsule. And a capsule, yep. That's gonna make life a little bit more difficult for Daichi. And he went a quick two prize cards up. Daichi responds with a flying Pikachu and a path to a peak to try and slow Atavio down. This turns off Star Portal and Greninja. However, the true versatility of the Shady Dealings engine was on full display, as Atavio was able to respond with a disgusting cross switcher into Bench Arceus turn, combined with a Moonlight Shuriken to KO Eevee, preventing any Jolteon action and setting up the Pikachu to be KO'd with a subspace swell. The V-Star Power, Star Portal, powering up the Radiant Greninja all in one turn, and it is going to be able to Moonlight Shuriken taking out the Eevee, denying Daichi from this disruptive route that he has within his deck and also peppering up this Pikachu very nicely. Daichi with access to star buff was able to fire back a boss plus two prize cards turn putting the pressure straight back on Atavio since he didn't have a backup attack already and this turn proved too much and Daichi found himself in top four. No, no it doesn't. can't get there. I think he's just out of energy cards. I think he's not got enough energy, he's not got enough attackers. Either way, it looks like Daichi takes a 2-0 victory and becomes the first player to move into top four of the Pokemon TCG World Championships. Another top eight match saw James Cox versus former world champion Andrew Estrada in a Palkia mirror match. James started off strong with a turn two Moonlight Shuriken to deny any shady dealings for Andrew forcing him to use Wall the Region turn two. He used here. I was wondering, there is just one Sobble in play and Andrew's hand might seem a little weak. 
So there's a, diff a couple different ways you could go about this. You could just try to soften up both Palkia here, or you could take out the Sobble, take away the Shady Dealings option, and hope your opponent uh, just doesn't draw very many options. And yeah, that's exactly what James is going for. Take away any opportunity for Shady Dealings, cut off that consistency engine, but also soften up one Palkia and really put Andrew in a tough position. Ooh, Disadvantage. Oh, is that a rule the region? Hate to see a second rule the region, but we are seeing it. This is uh, not a great start for Andrew. James determined to make sure Andrew couldn't play the game, targeted down Andrew's only other Sobble again, leading to a fairly quick concession. Yeah, James just little, swinging back in. Quick shooting and attack, and yep, that will be okay. a fairly uneventful first game, but James will take that one down. Unfortunately for Andrew, his luck wasn't gonna improve in game two, as he couldn't get a Palkia V down going first. This essentially means that his normal advantage of going first was now completely nullified as James took the first two prize KO. The big first turn advantage here, being able to be the first one who is able to evolve into the V-Star. Absolutely. And that's a, yeah, that's a huge disadvantage. If you go first, but then are not able to even get a Palkia out, that is huge. And James, I'm sure, is breathing a sigh of relief now. Passes the turn. Andrew stabilized the prize count, but left the door open for a monster four prize turn for James. But it wasn't going to be easy since he had to take a scoop up net out of the prizes off a quick shooting KO to make it happen. Let's see how it goes. Uh, we know that two scoop up nets are prized for James. So which prize cards are taken could be very relevant off this quick shooting. So there right, we, go. Here we go. Two prize cards and finds a scoop up net and a water energy. So that's Right, we're going to see Shady Dealings wow, from the Bosses Order. Wow, there we go. That's Bosses it. Order, Water Energy, Shady Dealings. Oh, my goodness. James Cox is going to advance to the top four here at the World Championships. <sighs> Andre Chierson found himself squaring off against Andre Skubal for his top eight game. And since Andre S removed his dark attackers, all Andre S can do is fire off Marnie's and Path to the Peak to defend himself against Andre C's Mu V Max deck. However, in a cruel twist of fate for Andre C, he actually prized both his Meloetas going second in game one, really removing his advantage and his game plan. Right. Yeah. Oh no, both Meloetta and the prize cards, not a good way to start. And looking at Andre S's turn one board state, this game would have been over if Andre C could have been able to weave in an escape rope plus Meloetta KO. However, Path to the Peak stuck and Andre C could only pass. Andre S was able to get off to the races and be able to accelerate energy and attack turn two, leaving Andre C in a very tough position with both his Meloetta's prize. And here's the moment he realized that. And while Andre C was about to mount a half decent comeback, Andre S was able to close it out with a sick top deck boss for game. But really battling back and making it possible yeah. to win this game. Wow. Is really, oh, or just draw the boss sort of sure. <laughs> oh yeah, it's just top deck it. There we go. Yep. Wow. In game two though, Andre C was in the driver's seat as he went a quick three prize cards up. And Andre S was only able to power it. The uh Rarely oh, used man. power edge for the knockout on the I UV was about, max. I was just about to say that. Usually not a good sign. <laughs> Leaving Andre S's only option to concede a turn after. That System and will do it. Hit. So this series is tied at 1-1. And we're going to head into a decisive game three. Andre making the comeback in this one and tying everything up. So with all to play for, game three got started and it started to get a little bit silly. Andre S was able to attach a Decidueye and slam down path. Opted to start with Hisuian Decidueye V. Wow. Whoa, just gonna attach an energy to it. There's a path to the peak, which could be a saving oh, grace, but this is goodness. devastating. Andre C flipped tails on his cram and he wasn't able to do anything. What? Okay. Okay, this is a huge cram matic This could be a game deciding flip. It's oh tails. Oh my gosh, it's tails. Andre does not have a way to bounce the path to the peak. Oh my goodness. Leaving Andre S to set up with mountain hunt of all things. Andre C couldn't remove path to the peak, and this allowed Andre S to get a KO with Decidueye V star of all things. Something we definitely didn't think we'd see happen in this matchup. Does 30 more for each card you discarded, so it's not even gonna be easy to get a knockout with this attack. Although he does have two energy cards oh just card. Oh my goodness. That Genesec V is gonna go down. <laughs> it's Sui and Decidueye pulling its weight here in this matchup. Andre C was able to take a KO with DTE, putting the pressure back on. 
feathers for the knockout. And one more top deck. It is a double turbo energy. That is going to allow Mew VMAX to attack and get a knockout here and get two prize cards. Wow, Andre keeping it alive here. And an ultra ball off the prize cards. That oh, can get a pumpkin. Thank goodness. Boot. Okay, wow. So we could potentially still see some comeback here from Andre. However, Andre S was able to split that pressure straight back with a boss KO when Andre sees only Mew V in play after a psychic leap. This pretty much secured Andre S's top four placement. Because it's very clear that I am in a position to win. What can I do to prevent my opponent from disrupting that? And there is a boss's orders to bring up the Mew V. Will it be a two prize knockout? And this is one prize card away. Wow. Mondrish moving on to the top four and eliminating Andre. But at least Andre C got to attack with Genesec V2. What a weird best of three. Gonna go out with a bang with the Techno Blast for the knockout, but Arceus V Star comes in and can simply use Trinity Nova for 200 damage. And Andres is going to advance to the top four here, even as a boss's orders yeah. take down the Meloetta. And that's going to be it. Wow. All over. Arceus V-Star moves on to the top four. The last top eight game saw former senior world champion Kaiwin playing Palkia versus Ryota. Ryota is playing a very similar deck to Daichi. So on face value, this is looking rough for Kyrin since the Jolteon will lock all the abilities from being used. And unfortunately for Kyrin in game one, he had a dud hand, only been able to attach pass. Ryota then took the advantage with a strong Trinity charge turn with an EV in play and a Jolteon in hand. Kyrin managed to set up a bit and strand a Moltres, but Ryota was able to start swinging back with a turn two max balloon via star buff with Chorion's ability on line two, leading to a fairly quick game one loss for Kaiwen. Out of the deck, just takes the knock, goes down to one prize card. Kaiwen sends up another Sobble and there's the scoop. Easy game one for Ryota, as I said, finds the matchup that he prepared for, that he was expecting to see here at the World Championship and executes it flawless. Game two, Kaiwen runs off to an early lead since he was able to keep Jotian at bay via Greninja's attack. Easy target in play to fix this prize map, and there it is, the Moonlight Shuriken gonna draw two prizes. And Roto actually gets stuck a little bit, but he does manage to even it up with a flying Pikachu, putting the pressure back on Kyron. But the early one prize KOs came back to haunt Ryota as Kyron could even it all up by two shotting on a flying Pikachu VMAX, making it all to play for in this win or go home scenario game three. And now after the shuffle, gonna take that final prize. Wow. And has the cross switcher ready to go. A huge draw. Brings strong. up the flying Pikachu VMAX. Brings up the Palkia V-Star, takes the knockout, and Kaiwin manages to clutch it up. We're going to game three, Adam. We're going to a third game here at the top eight cut of the World Championships. Rota fires off a dirty Marnie path turn two though, and Kaiwin found himself on the ropes. And unfortunately for him, he couldn't get back in the game as Ryota advances to top four too. Where is it? Is it there? There's double a double turbo. turbo energy. It can retreat to the flying Pikachu VMAX and that's it. Ryoto Ishiyama is going to advance to top four here at the Pokemon World Championships. What a game, even with the deck built to counter his opponent. Kaiwin pushed him to the edge and he was able to find that final piece to get the switch and take the win. Game number three, he advances. What an amazing set to see here at the World Championships in London. This means all the flying Pikachus made it into top four and won Palkia. Meaning the semi-finalists have all locked up $7,500 each already. But like I said before, these players are greedy and this isn't enough. They want to play for a shot to be in the final, to be immortalized in Pokemon history and to be known as a world champion. Let's see how top four went. Daichi versus James. Flying Pikachu versus Palkia. So we already know that Daichi is probably favored, but a massive opening was left in game one since Daichi prized both his Flying Pikachu VMAX. Got the Flying Pikachu VMAX to exploit that lightning weakness. We've got the memory capsule Jolteon to shut off the shady dealings. Wow, that's a big two prize cards prized both copies of Flying Pikachu VMAX. That is going to be possibly detrimental here for Daichi. However, he was able to get swinging turn two with an Arceus plus Jolteon, making life super hard for James, leading to a very quick concession. 
from the bottom of the prize. Yeah, there. And, and, and James is just going to scoop yep. things up. There's no way to win this. Daichi's going to go up 1-0 to start things out. Everything went perfectly. In game two, James opened with a beautiful double battle VIP pass turn, which is great. But he actually buys six different Pokemon with his Greninja, a Sobble, and a Palkia all chilling in the prize cards. Are all playing Path the Peak in their deck. Oh, wow. These are... Radiant four, Greninja, five, no. six Pokemon. Six what? Pokemon in the prizes. You're going to have so many different cards and ways to search them out. And James is going to know what's happening as soon as that first quick ball hits. That, that the battle VIP pass, but the VIPs are MIA. But via a Hisuian heavy ball, James is able to retrieve his Greninja and snipe Eevee down again. Moonlit Shuriken, yeah, Eevee, very smart. flying Pikachu. Yeah, this is a very smart play. Daichi doesn't go down without a fight, however, as he sets up two flying Pikachus and an Arc V-Star. James was able to keep the flying Pikachus at bay, really tightening the clamps and forcing a game three scenario. And uh, yeah, that's it. We're gonna go to game three. Game three is locked in. If James can win this game three, he would have bested the auto loss and secured himself a spot in the final. Going first proves well for Daichi this time as he manages to get Eevee down turn one. James's hand on the other hand is trash and his world's run is riding on a big two card draw from Greninja. These are big. This could make or break James's run here at the mm -hmm. World Championships. If there's no Palkia and Daichi just has the combination of cards to get a lockout with the Jolteon Thunderous Awakening, uh, that, that could just be it. So here we go. Two cards. What are these for James? Let's see. No. Cross Switcher and Melanie. No, can't even Melanie onto. There's no V Pokemon to Melanie onto. Has to rely off the Susuin Heavy Ball, but James already searched the deck and knows there's no Palkia in the prize cards. This is going to be a turn one with no Palkia. Daichi then goes off to the races with a turn two Jolteon plus Trinity Nova to boot. James has very little plays open to him apart from a Desperation cross switcher play, but Daichi had the switch in hand, leading to a concession from James, securing Daichi's place in the final. Jolteon really proving its worth. Dion and that's it, he concedes! Wow, Daichi Shimada is going to the finals. Your first finalist here at the Pokemon World Championships. The other top four game is a flying Pikachu mirror. But remember, Andre is playing the Babel, which lets you draw cards over the Jolteon package. This matchup has so many moving parts. Decidueye hits Arceus for weakness. Both players play it. Path to the Peak can stop your opponent's star birth, and both players play it. But both players also have outs the path to the peak via Punkaboo. And both the flying Pikachus hit themselves for weakness. What an absolute chess match. In game one, Andre went first, but he prized his Punkaboo, meaning Ryota's path to the peak made it difficult for him. Bibarel, though, had Andre's back as it drew Andre energy and Arceus V Star 2, keeping Andre in the game. But he's going to be launching the first attack, getting some really important damage onto the biggest threat on Ryota's board, the Isuin Decidue IV. And this is excellent from Andre. Ryota struggled turn two as a flurry of Marnies crippled him. And Andre capitalized, leading to a quick game one victory. What are we doing here? It looks I like it's a concession. <laughs> I think it is a concession. <laughs> so Ryota just gives the game to Andre here, basically saying, look, there's nothing I can do. So Andre wins game one and is halfway towards a world championship final appearance. That's pretty good. Yeah. In game two, Ryota actually prized both his Decidue IV star, but he didn't let them slow him down as his turn one was very good. Andre had an average turn one too. Again, Marnie plus Bath hampering both players' explosiveness. Ryota backed into a corner, only choice to stay into the game was to boss Andre's flying Pikachu and use his flying Pikachu to use Fly. Now, Fly is a very strong attack if you flip heads. You see, if you flip head, you actually do 120 damage times two for weakness. That means it hits for 240 and then you become immune to damage next turn. Perfect for picking up this cheeky KO and forcing a boss from Andre. However, if you flip tails, this attack actually does nothing. This means Royalty World's one now rests on this coin flip, a $25,000 potential coin flip. He managed to flip heads though, swinging the game straight back in Ryota's favor, leading to another game three scenario. Winner securing themselves a spot in the final to compete for the title of world champion. There is and the boss's is orders. Ryota the game three here in top four. Yeah, Ryota gets the KO, takes it to a game three. But unfortunately for Andre, he actually prized both his Bidoof. 
but he still managed to turn the tempo right up with a DTE attachment on Decidue IV, threatening a turn to KO. It's so bad for Andre, he's not been able to look at his own deck yet, so he's going to value the barrel in hand because it's the only way that unlocks his hand from his perspective, but he's going to learn some bad news real quick. But a cheeky path from Ryota brought back a turn from Andre as he is unable to do anything. Andre needs a dream top deck to stay alive in the game here. And Andre really is in a situation where he has to top deck a strong card here. We're looking for Arceus V-Star, we're looking for Ultra Ball. What do we see? It's a professor's research. That's not bad. As far as top decks go, that is not bad. You certainly use your pump Kaboo here, remove half of the peak, get rid of your other cards here. Professor's research, keeping Andre in the game. Let's see how it treats him. See that two individual. Oh, we've got the Arceus. We can star birth. Yeah, this is big. This puts Andre right back in the game. Rota's hand doesn't really support a massive retaliation as all he can do is a close quarters shooting from Decidue IV. He's just going to attack with the Hisuian Decidue IV here. So his hand is terrible. Yeah. That's I mean, big. close quarters shooting is enough, but really didn't do much else in the turn. This game comes down to a couple crazy turn. Andre tries to find a boss's orders, trying to remove Rota's flying Pikachu before it can try and close the game out. However, he misses it and it leaves him with a scary choice. Does he take a 50-50 with Fly to KO this V-Star and prevent Ryota from winning next turn with his own flying Pikachu? Or does he evolve his Pikachu into a V-Max and just hope that Ryota can't find another energy plus V-Max to close this game out? This is quite honestly a potential $25,000 decision right here. Andre goes for the VMAX play, putting the ball in Rota's court. All Rota needs is a VMAX plus energy here to secure himself a spot in the finals, making it an almost 60 card mirror match. That cool. So Andre is, is going for it. We are going to see right. the KO. And it all comes down to this. If Ryota has an energy and a flying Pikachu VMAX, he will KO Andre's flying Pikachu VMAX and get the win. If he doesn't, the opposite is going to happen. Let's see what happens. Potentially, I mean, assuming we retreat into the Eevee, which we've got. Oh, wow. Oh, it is Professor's Research. research. All he needs is one energy to attach manually and he will be going to the World Championship Finals. It's, it, this could not be bigger. And I'm not exaggerating. What have we got? What have we got? What have we got? Show us your hand. <laughs> I'm not seeing it I now. mean, you slam it. Yeah, <laughs> you, you slam, you it, slam right? it. If it's there, you slam it. It's a had a professor's research, but he missed it. And here is the Destiny 5 cards. There's two. We've not seen it yet. Boss is orders the final card. He's got it. He gets himself into the World Championship Finals. Andre is going to be going in to face um, our other Japanese player in the finals. We've got Daichi. We've got Andre. We have got our World Championship Final set. That was such a tense end game. Both players now have one night to rest practice and sweat all the intricacies of this matchup. Or so I thought, as I actually ran into Andre in the local club the night before the final. We were both dancing so much that the picture I took came out very blurry, but here it is. So after 16 regionals, two internationals and the Japan Championship, the World Championship final will come down to a mirror match. Who would have thought that? Two months ago, this archetype didn't even exist, and now it has locked up three out of top four placements and both in the finals. Daichi all on the Palkia lockdown strategy, George on preventing shady dealings from being used, while Flying Pikachu takes KOs with weakness, but giving up all board based draw in the process. Andre opting for a similar strategy, but removing the Jolteon for a Babel line so he can draw cards throughout the game. Both players capitalizing on Arc Intel's greed then removing Dunsparce left the door open for a previous bolt card Decidue IV star being able to secure the matchup. Both players reading the meta and adjusting perfectly, now it was their time to just win one more round. If they do, they secure a $25,000 prize and immortality in Pokemon history. Let's see what happens. Andre kicked it off with a nice turn one. Andre's turn one is fantastic. He can access an Arceus V. I believe he has a lightning energy in his hand that he can attach here. 
We'll see if he has any other actions he wants to do, but right now, looking pretty strong. I think he even has the switch in hand for the following turn. Daichi, however, threatened a Decidueye with a Trinity Charge and a Path to the Peak turn. Daichi, is it just flicking that Path to the, the path Peak path to the there? Peak debate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why put it into play? Of course, one thing we saw yesterday was both players bumping it off with the Pump Kaboo, but looking to do it like just for one turn and then re-establish it. We do see it coming down, and we then see a Marnie from Daichi. This is... This is a really dicey situation because if either player doesn't draw very well off this, Path to the Peak, they both play Luminion and Crobat to try and get out of it. Does Daichi have anything double we do? Turbo double Turbo energy is huge. This is big for Daichi. You can hear the crowd already excited by the pickup. And now the Trinity Charge will power up the benched Hisuian Decidueye from Daichi. How will Andre respond? He managed to stabilize with a Ponkabu plus Crobat to set up as well. So just putting a single fighting energy on there means that that V-Star is going to be yeah. completely ready to go next turn. Daichi had a litty hand off Andre's Marnie and was able to take a huge turn to KO with Decidueye V-Star, putting Andre on the ropes. So here comes the Yasuo and Decidueye V-Star, uses that Somersault Feathers, goes and KOs the Arceus. I mean, this is another card that is guaranteed to be in the, guaranteed to be in the world's winning deck, which I'm willing to bet <laughs> nobody called before for the tournament. And he was really on the ropes as Daichi goes four prizes ahead, streaming KOs with Somersault Feathers. Andre needs to Marnie to stay in this game as Daichi is only a boss away from winning. He's just hoping that he can two hit KO the Arceus and work towards work toward his own boss's orders next turn. Yeah, I think that's what you've got to do. Take the prize here and then hope there's something on the board. And it's actually a very similar situation to where Daichi was a minute ago. Andre has got a very easy KO on that Crobat with a boss's orders. So it, it really just comes down to which one of these players can close out the game. They've both taken key KOs. They've both put themselves in good positions to actually win. And Daichi's on the front foot. Daichi's got, you know, if they both draw out of it, then Daichi is going to win. But if Daichi can just whiff for one or two more turns, then Andre is going to be able to go crucially up one game to zero, taking out that Crobat. I think it's just one turn. I think Daichi's living yeah. on a top deck right now because Andre's putting himself in a good position, and as long as he can draw enough cards from Industrious Incisors over this turn and the next, he should have plenty of outs. As we keep saying, he plays four copies of Boss's Orders. It's been a huge decision that's really rewarded him all weekend. And he was actually able to bob and weave that Boss's Orders too, as he finds himself in a position to boss his orders for game two. Andre just debating whether it's worth going for a Marnie here, or will he simply industrious for three cards? He does, and he's got boss's orders in hand, so I believe that means that Andre, and even picks up the path of the peak, so can deny Daichi the Luminion outs as well. I think he's actually in a very good spot here. You retreat out of your Decidueye, you take a KO, and you're holding boss's orders for the next turn. Daichi will need to top deck here if he is going to win the game. This top deck needs to find Boss's orders or Marnie for Daichi to stay in the game. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to do it as Andre took the win. To himself, let's see what the what top is deck it? is. He's put it in the hand, he hasn't slammed it down. It's, it's, it's I think it might it's be an terrible. Arceus. <laughs> it might be an Arceus V. So we're going to see Daichi retreat here, but we know it's not going to do, it's not going to do any good here. We know that Andre is going to win. This is it. Daichi needs to win this game to stay in it. If Andre wins, he will be the Pokemon champion. Daichi needs to do the reverse sweep here. Win or go home. Daichi has a good start, just as Andre did. This game too is way too close to call. Andre's four bosses orders came in super handy as he is able to jump ahead in the prize advantage. Daichi falls behind a little bit more as all he can do is somersault feathers into a flying Pikachu VMAX again. So now, Andre is only a boss away from winning. This is Hisuian Decidueye, but the game is not over. We can get one more card from his one second bit barrel. Off that second bit barrel. Is oh. it game over? Is it game over? Is it a boss's order? Show us the card! We need to see! Oh, we... You slam it. Yeah, you slam it. <laughs> you would slam it. Orders. It's so not come Andre's down. Andre's hand is all Pokemon, I think. Yeah, it is. So it's going to be a Marnie. Daichi is living right now. It's... Unfortunately, he actually missed it but he still has the next turn to try again. But this time, Daichi is one prize away from winning himself, meaning the ball is now in Andre's court. If he can find Boss here, $25,000 are his, and his name will be etched in the Hall of Fame as a Pokemon champion. This turn is it. Whoever finds Boss's orders first will win the game. Let's see what happens. He has to move his own Decidueye out of the way. It's too easy for Andre to win. He already has an attacker set up. 
Yeah, there's already too much damage on there. There's too much energy on Andre's Pokemon. He's got everything he needs to get a KO on that Asu Insidui. Retreats to the pump, Kaboo, but I don't think it doesn't. Let's see it, Andre. Are we going to see a boss's orders in his hand? We there it is! It there, and Andre will be your 2022 Pokemon trading card game world champion for the second time in three tournaments. Europe's gone and done it, Joe. Congratulations to Andre. It's a phenomenal series, a 2-0 win. We have a new European world champion. Andre Stubal, a fantastic series played by both players there. And uh, wow, an emotional time for both of them right now. Fantastic win. Oh, that came very, very tense here. We're sitting there.